All right, so welcome uh, everybody. This is going to be another um, deeper reading of Boober. <laughs> I, you know, I always love like that I call it like a deeper reading of Boober because I'm pretty sure it's not a deeper reading, but it's just me going slower with it and adding some commentary. Um, but if you enjoy that, if you enjoy my commentary, and if you enjoy, uh, you know, some of my thoughts on how I'm reading and understanding Boober, then this would be the the deeper reading, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, it's always, you know, it's always an interpretation, so I don't know how deep we can go. But anyways, um, last time we left off of Boober was critiquing experience. So so now we're going to go into the, the, the spheres of relation. Okay, so the spheres in which the world of relation arises are three. First, our life with nature. There, the relation sways in gloom beneath the level of speech. Creatures live and move over against us, but cannot come to us. And when we address them as thou, our words cling to the threshold of speech. Now, I do want to point out something before like, I finish this whole thing. When Buber is talking about our life with nature in context to relation, you have to understand that we can only address them as thou, right? This is a very like specific thing, right? We address them as thou, okay? Um, now continuing on. Second, our life with men, there the relation is open and in the form of speech. We can give and accept the thou. Third, our life with spiritual beings. There, the relation is clouded, yet it discloses itself. It does not use speech, yet begets it. It does not use, um, we perceive no thou. But nonetheless, we feel we are addressed, and we answer, forming, thinking, acting. We speak the primary word with our being, though we cannot utter thou with our lips. But with what right do we draw what lies outside speech into relation with the word of the primary word. So notice, like notice these like very, like, I mean, it took me a while to actually understand how subtle these differences were. Um, so Buber defi divides relation into three, three spheres. I, I, I don't like saying that word. I'm going to say three domains. Okay. That's going to be better for me. He, he divides relation to three domains. The first is nature. The second is man, or what he will later call personal. And the third domain is spirit. Uh, so notice like how the I and thou functions within these domains of, within these three domains, right? In the first domain, the domain of nature, we cannot be addressed by the thou in nature. We can only address nature as thou. Um, now when we go into like the, the domain of men or personal, we can give and receive thou through actual through our actual language, right? So this this is this is gonna be something very unique in itself. The fact that we can sort of have these uh, discussions at, in, in, in our sphere of, in, in our sphere of personal being, um, and then now with spirit, you cannot address or see the thou, but you become addressed, and the only way that you reply is by your very acting. Right, your very being is the reply. Right, in some sense, this is it's almost like very Heideggerian in, in the sense of like your understanding of being is already by the way you are in the world. Right, since you are in the midst of being in the world, you already have an understanding of being by already being thrusted in the thereness of the world. Um, so I'm sorry if you guys hear the dogs, the dogs are always going to be wrestling probably beside me, but. 
<laughs> they stopped now that I pointed them out, but they're probably going to be wrestling again. Anyways, yeah, so that that's like the the main takeaway that actually it, I didn't catch like ironically the first two times when I read this book I didn't catch this. Um, it only it took me like a third time looking it over and be like oh so with nature we have the the, the spheres of being right the in such a way that we can only address them as thou personal being we can give in and sort of we can give and take the thou through speech and then we are but in the domain of spirit we are addressed only why we cannot address so i think that's very important that when we talk about the difference between spirit and nature is that with nature we address but by spirit we are addressed and the only way we can reply is through like thinking forming and just our general being um so so continuing on um Buber says, in every sphere in its own way, through each process of becoming, that you're going to hear the dogs now, so they're going to be wrestling. <laughs> I could address them, but, you know. <laughs> um, okay. In every sphere in its own way, through each process of becoming, that is present to us, we look out toward the fringe of the eternal thou. In each, we are aware of a breath from the eternal thou. In each thou, we address the eternal thou. So there is this like, what, what I like about the way, way, the way Boober is proposing, guys, right now, you guys got to do it right now. <laughs> um, the, the, way, the way I like that Boober is proposing is, is, He's saying every sphere has its own process of becoming. And so whatever thou you encounter within that process of becoming, it's a link to the eternal thou, right? It, it's, we address the eternal thou in that way. Um, but now Buber is going to give us an example of how do we exactly address a thou in nature. And so this is going to be like one of my favorite examples of like the tree. Um, so we're, we'll go into that. Um, Buber says this, consider a tree. I can look on it as a picture, stiff column in a shock of light or a splash of green shot with a delicate blue and silver of the background. I can perceive it as a movement, flowing veins on clinging, pressing pith, suck of the roots, breathing of the leaves, cease, cease, ceaseless commerce with earth and air and the obscure growth itself. I can classify it in a species and study it as a type and its structure and mode of life. I can subdue its actual presence and form so sternly that I recognize it only as an expression of law, of the laws in accordance with which a constant opposition of forces is continually adjusted or of those in accordance with which the component substance mingle and separate i can dissipate it and perpetuate it in number pure. <laughs> i can dissipate it and perpetuate it in number uh, and pure numerical <laughs> and now now they're wrestling for real uh, and pure numerical relation and all this, the tree remains my object, occupies space and time, and has its nature and constitution. So I hope you guys can deal with the dogs wrestling in the background, basically, because that's what's going on. <laughs> but Boober's example of the tree is, notice how everything that he's describing of the tree, right? I can perceive its movement. I can classify it. I can, you know, study its form, put it, put it into some like numerical relation. Um, but this is going to be 
the this is going to be the object of like this is going to be the word of I it right this is the realm of it doing this to a tree is the realm of I it okay so uh, Buber continues right it can however also come about or I'll just actually I'll go step back he says in all this a tree remains my object occupies space and time and has its nature and constitution it can however also come about if I both will and grace that in considering the tree I become bound up in relation to it the tree is now lo no longer it I have been seized by the power of exclusiveness to affect this to affect this it is not necessary for me to give up any of the ways in which I consider the tree. So that's actually a very important point that Boover is making. So every time that we talk about the I it relation and the I and thou relation, Boober is saying the I and it relation is, is necessary and important. And it doesn't mean like giving this up. It doesn't mean giving this up at all. Um, but we have to understand that the I it relation, even though it is necessary and very much a part of our lives, it isn't everything, right? It, it isn't um, everything about reality and life. Um, so this is why Buber says the attitude is twofold and everything like that. It's an, it's necessary, but at the same time, it's not all that there is. So that's why he says it's not necessary for him to give up any of the ways in which I consider the tree. And then he follows. He goes, there is nothing from which I could have, which I would have to turn my eyes away in order to see and no knowledge that I would have to forget. Rather is everything, picture and movement, species and type, law and number, indivisibly united in this event. So this is important, right? So what makes the I relation so attractive is that we're always sort of like extracting and using, perceiving the tree in a way of its qualities and so on. But actually the way Buber is saying is like, look, in the power of the I and thou relation, all this stuff combine into one, right? It becomes indivisible, right? It, it, it doesn't, you know, you can't, separate which from which it just becomes this indivisible um, unit and he follows he says everything belonging to the tree is in this its form and structure its colors and chemical composition its intercourse with the elements and with the stars are all present in a single whole the tree is no impression no play of my imagination no value depending upon my mood, but it is bodied over against me and has to do with me as I with it, only in a different way. Let no attempt be made to stop the strength from the meaning of the relation. Relation is mutual. The tree will have a consciousness then similar to our own? Of that I have no experience, but do you wish through seeming to succeed in it with yourself once again, to disintegrate that which cannot be disintegrated. I encounter no soul or dryad of the tree, but the tree itself. So, so one, of the, one of the questions that is actually kind of common when you start thinking about, like when you start reading the I and Tao, and you start thinking about, especially the domain of nature, there is some problems with some of Buber's like theories or at least some of the things that he kind of leaves like in open that feels like it doesn't answer everything. But um, Buber does try to answer some of these questions in the postscript. But one of the main questions is like, okay, if the I and thou relationship is predicated on like mutuality, if we're only just addressing the the nature as thou, right? And there's never like a mutual, there's never like a being addressed back. Where is the mutuality um, 
within that relation? Where where is that? If every every if every relation is mutual, where is that um, mutualness that Buber likes to like preach about? Um, basically, and it's funny because when I first read it, when I first read this, and I read this a second time too, I was like, I. I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. Um, and there's still an aspect of that. The The best way that I can explain it is the mutuality with nature, at least, is by letting, like, by, it's, it's a letting of the tree. Like, you don't, the mutuality already exists in the letting of the tree. And, and what do I mean by the letting? Meaning, like, you don't reduce the tree to its, like, chemical structures or its, like, form and, like, elements and so on. You look at the tree as if all those things are indivisible from the tree itself. The form, the structure, the chemical composition. And that That is what Buber is trying to say, right? This This is what it means to have, like, a mutual relation with the tree is that you don't dissect it. You you see everything that you've noticed about the tree as a sort of like indivisible whole, um, and and then and and that's really like the mutual relation that is existing. Is that the moment you see this wholeness, this individual wholeness of the tree itself? Um, well, I would say this indivisible wholeness of the tree itself. Then you realize that there is this mutual relation with the tree and you. Um, but again, just to stress the fact that the I and it relation for Buber is definitely a necessary relation. It is a relation that makes possible the I and thou relation. Um, and, and again, it's a very useful like structure to, you know, it's the way we use science basically. <laughs> and, and the way we go about in the world, this I and it relation is um necessary but also at the same time just because it is necessary and i think this is kind of like the implicit argument in buber is that even though this i and it relation is necessary and in the way that we actually are in the world right you know this division between subject and object even though it is a sort of necessary thing um just to reemphasize again it buber does not think that's all that there is right um in fact, there's a way to sort of enrich our our being in the world uh, by having an I and thou relation, which is what you know Buber is going to stress a lot. And, and and Buber makes it very explicit that the I and it relation is not something like evil, so to speak. Right? It's not. It's not evil in itself. Um, it's only it's only evil when you take it as like the only way to be. Um, at least that would be kind of my interpretation on that. But anyways, um, as long as we don't try to disintegrate the tree, there's already a, a mutual relation going on, right? Just by not disintegrating the tree into its parts and components, but in fact seeing all those components and parts and elements as an indivisible, indivisible whole, that is where the mutual relation exists, by seeing the tree as a tree and nothing less than that um, all right so that 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 is the end of my uh my loudy and rowdy loudy and rowdy uh talk with you guys because the dogs were wrestling in the background but it was perfect right it, it was about nature so nature was responding <laughs> but all right yeah so um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed that. Anyways, take care.